Well, welcome to New City. Happy Valentine's Day that's coming up. Happy Oscars Day this uh, afternoon. Happy Lincoln's birthday. My kids actually have a day off, and I said, why? <laughs> she didn't know. She had to go look it up. Go, it's Lincoln's birthday. And um, my name is Kevin Ha. I'm the lead pastor here at New City. We are trekking through the book of Luke in a series called The Gospel for Everyone. We do this. We trek through um, Bible because we want the Holy Spirit to guide us through the Word as we journey together with Jesus. So the title of the sermon today is An Undercurrent of Desperation. Now, since today is the day of the Academy Awards, I have a trivia for all of you. Who won, or which film won the 1999 Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Director, and Best Original Screenplay and Best Cinematography? Nope. Nope. Come on, 1999. Hmm? Nope, nope, nope. That's much older. You guys are pathetic. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. That's to wake you up. All right. The answer is American Beauty. Uh, did anybody say that? Did I just miss it? Oh, you said it. I, I'm sorry. Okay. It's a movie about an undercurrent of desperation in a seemingly perfect American family in the suburbs. Um, I think Henry David Thoreau said it well. He said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. In other words, most of us exist in a state of desperation, but we are afraid to admit it. We're going to look at a story of 10 men who were desperate. And I want to see if you and I can identify with them. It's a familiar story of 10 men who had leprosy and one Samaritan, a religious outcast, who came back to Jesus to praise God and to thank Jesus. Do you know, there's so much to this story that meets the eye. I want us to imagine ourselves... Uh, there. Can we do that? I, I want to, as we read the passage, I want us to put ourselves in the context. Um, I want you to uh, kind of smell the place. I want you to feel the place. Wow, you guys are dark. Okay. I want, I want you to feel the place. I want you to kind of try to enter into the minds of various different characters uh, in the story. Um, so let's go to Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. Verses 11 to 19. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distant and distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. It's a short story. So where are we in a story? They're on their way to Jerusalem. And you know why Jesus is headed to Jerusalem? He is headed to Jerusalem to give his life as a sacrifice for all of our sins. Now, the disciples knew uh, that Jesus was the Messiah, that he came. He's the one who was promised by the prophets. 
and that when he gets to Jerusalem, he was going to do something big. But they saw the kingdom of God as something very narrow, something only for the Jewish people. It, it is the reclaiming of Israel's rights in the world. That's how they saw it. Luke, the writer of this particular gospel, he is a Gentile. He's not a Jew, and he wants to give us a step, snapshot of the foreshadowing of the breath of the kingdom community, that Jesus is not just a Messiah for Jews. He is the Messiah for everyone. And so Jesus is traveling. So Luke tells the story of Jesus and his encounter with the Samaritan as he's traveling in the border of Samaria and Galilee. Luke is very particular about the location as this event happened. Now, Samaria is most likely an area populated by the remnants of the northern kingdom. Remember, after Solomon, Israel was uh, divided into northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and southern kingdom, which is called Judah, Judaism, Jewish person. That word actually comes from the word Judah, not the word Israel. The northern kingdom was conquered by foreign powers, and many of them intermarried with pagans. They, however, continued to believe in the Torah, the law of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, but they didn't believe in the prophets, the other parts of the Old Testament. They built a temple in Mount Gerizim to offer sacrifices according to the book of Leviticus, the, according to Torah. So they were also most likely one of the powers who opposed the building of the temple in Jerusalem during the time of Ezra. You see that in the stories of the prophets. Over a long period of time, there were conflicts between these two um, nation states, uh, Judah and Samaria. And from time to time, they fought each other. There was violence. There was killing between the two. Um, and so they came to hate each other. Jews wanted nothing to do with Samaritans. You know, so from Galilee to Jerusalem, the fastest way to get there is to go through Samaria. But Jews would often go around so that they didn't have to go through Samaria. Jesus didn't do that. We know from the story of the women um, at the well, the Samaritan women, that Jesus, it was his custom to go through Samaria. And in this story, uh, he was probably on his way to Jerusalem through Samaria. Now, there was a group of men outside the village who came upon him, who met him, and they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And I'd like for us to stop right here and think about who they are. People with leprosy were diagnosed by priests at that time, and only the priests could also pronounce them clean. Once they, once they have been diagnosed as unclean, if you look at Leviticus chapter 13, there's a very complicated and exhaustive procedure to diagnose somebody as a, uh, with a skin disease. And so according to Leviticus 13, the diseased person had to live outside, live alone outside the camp, and wear torn clothes, keep his or her hair disheveled, cover his or her upper lips, cry out, unclean, unclean. They couldn't live with their family. I mean, think about the life of these folks. You know, think about people who have coronavirus, except that there was no hope of medical cure, but it's chronic, although not deadly. They believed that leprosy was a contagious disease at the time. We now know that it's not that contagious unless you come in repeated contact with their nose or, and, and mouth droplets. Imagine the, the trauma and the suffering that they face. You know, people are not born 
with leprosy. They got it at some point in their life. It's a, it's a bacteria infection. It is a disease where you lose sensation of your nerves, so you actually can't feel your limbs. Leprosy is an infectious disease that causes severe, disfiguring skin sores and nerve damages in your arms, legs, and skin areas around the body. You lose sensation of the limbs, so because you don't feel it, you end up hurting it, and you get disfigured. Imagine their emotional and relational trauma. Imagine how lonely and hurt they were. They were kicked out of their home, their families, their synagogues, their jobs, their community. They lived outside the village. By law, they couldn't go near anyone. And any time they came 50 feet of anyone, they had to cry out, unclean, unclean. Imagine the emotional impact this would have in their life. Depression, PTSD, I'm sure. Imagine their financial trauma. This was way worse than any kind of bankruptcy. They had no way to actually support themselves. They remained at the mercy of people around them to help them. They were desperate. I'm not sure if you can identify fully with them, but I think many of us live li lives lives with an undercurrent of desperation. Maybe you're struggling with an illness, cancer, stroke, infection of some sort, and, and you're scared. Maybe one of your family members has been diagnosed with an illness. Maybe you're Maybe you're suffering from chronic pain, and I know how difficult that could be. You go from doctor to doctor, but you can't find a resolution to the issue. Maybe you're struggling financially. You don't know where next month rent is going to come from. Maybe you're struggling with your relationships. There's this anger, bitterness, and resentment that's building from within, and been hungry for warmth and love and approval, but it's not to be found. Maybe you're, you've been struggling with your singleness. Um, you try to meet someone, but you just have not been able to find that someone special, and you're beginning to wonder if you will ever find that someone. Maybe you just broke up with someone, or maybe you're going through a divorce and you feel beat up and your self-image is in the gutter. Maybe it's an addiction in your life, addicted to chemical substance, addicted to greed and pride, addicted to temper, and you've been hiding it. Even though you don't want to be like this, you feel like you're stuck in a vicious cycle that you cannot get out of. Maybe you're de so desperate for approval and love that you feel like you don't really have a foundation for living. You just go f from one person to another trying to please that person. Maybe you're so desperate for success that any sign of decline in your business or any disapproval by your superior causes your stomach to sink. You know, even if you think things are going well, maybe you get that feeling of dread on Sunday night if you, as you think about going back to work on Monday. And maybe you're feeling a sense of meaninglessness in your life, a sense of emptiness in your life, even though, you know, things are seemingly going well. And even if you think things are going well, we're all gonna be facing a desperate time someday. We're all gonna get sick. We're all gonna die. This is a common experience for all human beings. There is an undercurrent of desperation in our lives. Now, if you feel like this, these men <clears throat> with 
leprosy, if you have the sense of undercurrent of desperation in your life, I have good news to share with you that there is hope in Jesus Christ. These men, when they heard about Jesus, that he can heal, that he really cares, they made up their minds to go meet with Jesus. And, you know, when they got to him, they couldn't go near him because the law pre prevented them from doing so, although Jesus would have embraced them if they did, huh? because there are other stories in the Bible that tell us that. So they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. You know, I, I, it would be my guess that there were more than 10 people uh, living in the camp uh, of, of people with leprosy. But these 10 people decided to go to Jesus and seek healing. Can you hear their voices? Can you hear their desperation? How about you? Have you cried out to Jesus? Have you made up your mind to go meet Jesus? Are you just, or are you just sitting there wondering if he really cares or if he's really busy or if he's really real or and I know sometimes when you're going through that you just don't even feel like getting out of bed because you're scared to hope because hope can break your heart but these men went and cried out to Jesus Jesus master have pity on us then the scripture says Jesus saw them. Yes, Jesus saw their suffering. Jesus sees your suffering. He sees your addiction. He sees your trauma. He sees your insecurity. He sees your loneliness. He sees the financial trouble you're in. He sees your pain and your hurts and your emptiness. He sees you. And Jesus said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now, why go to the priests? Why not heal them right there? Why, why, why go to the priests? Under the rules of Leviticus 14, in order for a person with leprosy to be declared clean, you have to go to the priest and you have to go through certain, you know, offering of sacrifices, certain examinations, very, very thorough examination by the priest. And then after a certain time, the priest can declare you clean. And only then you can go back to your family and to your home. It's interesting that <clears throat> Jesus didn't heal them right there, and then tell them to go to the priest. I mean, he's done that before. So this is an unusual situation. In this instance, he told them to go to the priest before they were healed. He, he called them to take a step of faith, the faith that Jesus would heal. Let's stop right here now and think about this a little bit more. If you're living in an undercurrent of desperation, what is Jesus calling you to do? He's, yeah, pray. He's calling you to believe him. He's asking you to believe that he can heal you. He's asking you to believe that he could bring you wholeness in your life. Now, what does that mean in your life? What does it mean to take a step of faith? The most important thing about faith is the object of faith, what you believe in, what you have faith in. Faith is not about believing in something without any doubt. It is not about the ability to conjure up certainty, kind of psycho you know, like build up and say, I believe, I believe, I believe. It's, it's not trying to pretend like you have certainty when you don't. 
It is about coming to see that you can't do this on your own. You are powerless to change yourself, and you are powerless to change certain situations that led you to this desperate state. Instead of putting faith in yourself to get out of this, to change, you are called to put your faith in Jesus, that Jesus can heal, that Jesus can bring wholeness to your life. Would you take that step of faith? You heard about Jesus. You heard stories of what he has done in the lives of many people. We share testimonies here for that reason. You've heard that Jesus can heal physically, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually and bring wholeness. You heard that people can, that Jesus can free you from the vicious cycle of sin and pain and emptiness and meaninglessness. You heard that you can find a new life in Jesus, that he can give you a new life filled with excitement, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He'll give you a new purpose, a new mission for life. There's something excited, exciting about Jesus. But have you taken a step of faith, just as these men did? Have you acknowledged that you are desperately in need of God in your life? Have you acknowledged that you're messed up, that you're a sinner, that you can't put your life back together, and that you help, need help from God? This faith, you know, I know some people come to church and go, what are you talking about? We're all Christians. We, we, we all have faith. But sometimes people come with faith in themselves. I can do this with God's help. Faith is saying, I can't do this but for your help. That's the turn. That's the step of faith. Have you turned towards Jesus and make up, make, make up your mind to seek his power in your life? You cried out to God for his power in your life. Have you opened yourself up to the work and the power of God in your life? Do you want to take that step of faith? You know, as I thought about what made them go, these 10, to actually um, turn and, and obey Jesus and go towards the priest even before they were healed, I, I thought about, yes, they believed in Jesus, but what else caused them? And I think to myself, it was their desperation, right? When you're desperate, when you're... When, I, I, you know, it's their desperation that compelled them to go. I know so many of us are so averse to acknowledging our own desperation and admit our need. Jesus didn't chastise them for acting out of desperation. He honored them for that by healing them. We need to come to the same realization. Our desperate situation should lead us closer to God. You know, but the story doesn't end here. All 10 of them were healed, but one man came back, a Samaritan, a member of a despised people group, a heretic. I mean, they didn't have the right belief system about God. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Now, why didn't the other nine come back? And why only this Samaritan? We, we tend to be very judgmental about the, uh, about the other nine. But as I said, they had faith. They sought out Jesus. They took a step of faith. But yet, they didn't come back. Why did they come back? Think about the other nine. They're walking towards the, the temple, which is actually a three to four days away walk. And during the journey, they are healed. How, how do you think they felt? I think they felt awesome. <laughs> they, they were probably praising God. They were probably saying, thank you, Jesus. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure. But they had a choice. 
do I turn back and go thank Jesus or do I go to the priest and declare my, get declared clean and go see my family? I'm sure they wanted to see their kids, their mom and dad, their brothers and sisters, their friends. They wanted to go home and celebrate the blessing. They, you know, they, they got what they were hoping for. They got what they were asking for from Jesus. So they decided to continue on ahead. They were satisfied with the blessing. But here is a powerful truth of this passage. Their faith in Jesus got them healed, but they missed out on the bigger blessing and plan that Jesus had. Let's think about the Samaritan's faith. When he saw that he was healed, he decided to come back to the giver of the blessing. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, praised God, and thanked Jesus. He said to him, and then Jesus said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Jesus went beyond healing them. The word here that's translated as made well is this word in Greek, the original language, sozo. Almost all the time that that word is used, it, it's, it means save um, in, in a sense of rescue or deliver from danger or divine salvation. Um, there are other words that Luke could have used to uh, indicate healing, uh, words, Greek words like therapy or where we get the word therapy, or eomai, which were more common words used to indicate healing from a physical ailment. All 10 of them wanted healing from leprosy, but Jesus gave this one person who came back something more, true wholeness in his life. I know sometimes when we take a step of faith, we do it because we think God's going to bring healing of a certain physical disease or, or bring, certain, bring freedom from certain pain or loneliness or bring us certain blessings or help us, you know, in this journey of recovery or, you know, bring us a relational blessing or, or we seek God for a particular thing. That's often why we come to God and all of us, all of these things are great things to come to God for. Just like the, lep, uh, the, the men with leprosy, they came to God because they needed something from Jesus and that was okay. But... When we come to Jesus, what he has for us is way bigger than what we're asking him for. His plan is so much bigger. Here's what Jesus wants to bring into our lives. There's a passage in uh, Galatians that talk about the, the blessings that Jesus wants to bring into our lives. It's the fruit of the Spirit, which is a product of a life lived with Him in the Holy Spirit. It says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's way more than healing or freedom from that which causes your desperation or the undercurrent of desperation. Jesus wants to lead you to live in love. No more bitterness, resentment, hatred, just real love. Jesus wants you to live in joy, not in pain or hopelessness. Jesus wants you to live in forbearance, not in anger or vindictiveness. Jesus wants you to live in kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, not mean-spirited. Jesus wants you to live in self-control and not as a victim of vicious cycle out of controlness in your life. God has so much more for you. I mean, if you just look at the list, isn't this what we all seek? 
God has more for you than you come to him for. You can get the thing that you're desperate for. God will bless you as you obey and as you take the step of faith. But there is a lot more. The step of faith is only the first step. So many times we want something to God and so we cry out to him and something really important. And he answers your prayers and he blesses you with it. And so many of us are satisfied with that. Your relationship is getting better. You're sober for some time. You have a job to pay rent. You get healed from an illness. And some of you are making great progress. You know, you've been, it's, been, it's been much, much better as you begin to follow Jesus. You know, you, you're seeing healing. You're seeing less desperation in your life. But you can get the gift, but miss out on the giver and all the, the amazing things, more things that he has for you. You know what else he has for you? It's not just the fruit of the Spirit, which is really happiness, right? Happiness unhindered by anything that could happen to you. That's, that's, what, that's what he's getting to. But there's more. He has gifts of the Spirit too. He gives you, he gives you gifts, enablements to live your life beyond yourself. He has a job for you. He has a mission for you. He has a purpose for you. He's building this amazing kingdom which he inaugurated by coming, incarnation, and which he redeemed us into by his death through atonement, and he resurrected, and he said he's coming back to restore this world and complete the kingdom of God. He has this plan to restore not only us, not only your heart into wholeness, but he has a plan to restore the world into wholeness where there is no disease, no poverty, no injustice, no, no hatred, no racism, no classism, no sexism. He's calling us to this beautiful vision. He's calling us to Begin to taste the beauty of this kingdom. He, he's calling us to learn to live in the presence of this king the, through the Holy Spirit. And he's, he's calling us to roll up, roll up our sleeves and participate in building that kingdom and learn to live life beyond ourselves. Jesus has a lot more for you then healing you from your desperation. Take the step of faith. That's good. Allow the undercurrent of desperation to put you in the trajectory of Christ. But as, you're, as you see yourself improving, come back and fall at the feet of Jesus and see, that, see all that he's doing. Be made whole. See the beauty of who he is, the beauty of what he is doing, the beauty of the kingdom of God. See it, feel it, live in it, taste it. You know, as I thought about this, the reality is that you and I actually know a lot more about Jesus than these 10 men with leprosy. We know that Jesus went to Jerusalem. He took up the cross and died for our sins. We know how much he loves us. We know how much he sacrificed for us, how much he suffered for us. Come to his feet and thank him. Thank you, Jesus, and praise him. Come back again and again and again and sit at the feet of Jesus saying, thank you, 
and praise him. And, 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 and as you learn to live in the presence of the Holy Spirit, come to the feet of Jesus and just sit in silence and allow him to speak to your soul. Sit and listen to him and sit and know him. Sit and be embraced by him and learn to live at the feet of Jesus. And this, this will lead you to wholeness beyond something that you can imagine. You know, but here's a little secret. You'll get to know as you, more, as you spend more and more time at the feet of Jesus. He is enough for you. You don't need anything other than him. Now, even if he doesn't heal you, even if, even if he doesn't resolve the thing that you've been so desperate about, you will find that he is enough because he's so good. And that will free you. Amen. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we acknowledge. Oh, Lord, that one way or another, one time or another, we live with an undercurrent of desperation in our lives. Lord, if we don't feel that, if we don't acknowledge that, help us to examine our hearts and see the depth of our brokenness, depth of sin, depth of not only things that are in our hearts, but in our society that we are a part of. Lord, help us to see. Help us to come to acknowledge our need for you. And help us to walk towards you. Help us to cry out to you. Help us to lament. We might not have the right theology. We might not know anything. But help us to just know that we need to just face Jesus and cry out to him, oh Lord. Lord, if there's anyone here that just may be living in an undercurrent of desperation but do not have the desire to cry out to you because they have lost hope, I pray that, Lord, you would touch their hearts. I pray that you would touch their heart by your spirit. That you just open your heart. I pray that, you, Lord, you would touch their heart and help them to hope in you and help them to walk towards you, oh Lord. And in obedience to you, help them to take a step of faith, oh Lord. Step of faith based on felt need, but nonetheless, step of faith, oh Lord. Faith that we can't do it. So only in you that we can do this, oh Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit the power of your presence in our lives. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us, oh, Lord, to take that step of faith. And I want to just speak to any one of you in your heart. Do you feel the Holy Spirit tugging you and say, take that step of faith? Maybe you thought you have taken a step of faith in the past. Maybe you thought to yourself, well, you know, I made a decision to be a better person. That's not a step of faith. I made a decision to turn a new leaf in my life. That's not a step of faith. Step of faith is acknowledging I can't do it with my own power. I can only do it through God who empowers me. I need your help. That's the step of faith. Acknowledging your powerlessness and churning your heart towards Jesus. Would you do that? Would you take a moment right now, if you have not done that, to take a moment and say, Lord, I, I, I acknowledge my powerlessness. I acknowledge that I can't do this on my own. I need you 
That's the step of faith. Would you do that? Lord, continue to speak into people's heart, oh Lord. And I know many people in this room have taken that step of faith. Yet, we've just been satisfied with His blessings. We've been looking to Jesus to help us with our own agenda, to help us with our desperation, help, with, help us with healing and help us. But we haven't seen this amazing beauty of sitting at the feet of Jesus and getting to know him and beginning to see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives fruit of the spirit that go way beyond the desperation that goes to the heart Lord Heavenly Father I pray that Lord we would now take the second step of sitting at the feet of Jesus coming back and hearing you and Lord thanking you and praising you and worshiping you and, and learning to live in your presence in the Holy Spirit in silence and community Lord, and, and learning to live by the, by the Spirit so that we may bear the fruit of the Spirit. Help us, O oh Lord, to, to, to discern the gifts that you've given to us so that we can learn to live our lives beyond ourselves, Lord. That, that, that our lives go beyond just our needs but to the people around us, to the world, to the vision of the kingdom of God, what you are here to do and what you are calling us to do. I pray that, Lord, you would lift us out of our desperation and not only heal us, oh Lord, and, 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 and not only bring us wholeness and the fruit of the Spirit, but Lord, take us beyond to being a part of the kingdom work that you are doing, oh Lord. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, Rain upon us, O oh Lord. Rain upon us, O oh Lord. We thank you. Continue to guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah.